What's up everybody, welcome back to the Unknown Codings channel. Uh, today's video is going to cover a number of topics, but they're all uh, in relation to the chemical strip setup that I'm currently using from Express Chem. Now, I have actually since upgraded this system, that'll be covered in the next video. Uh, like I said, this was kind of an entry level system for you guys. If you haven't seen the video about this system initially, I will go ahead and throw that up um, in the link, or uh, put a link for that in the description rather, so you can check it out. But this video is gonna answer a bunch of the questions you guys had about that video um, that you left in the comments, and then I got some via email as well. Uh, it's also gonna show you how to kind of take care of this setup, and let's get into it. All right, so one of the main questions that I got, or at least I got repeatedly, was how long is this setup lasting? Like how many sets of wheels for can a, a 55 gallon drum of this do? Because the cost of this uh, is actually pretty high for a chemical. Now I've used this same exact chemical for four months, the same drum, uh, I actually still have some left in the original barrel uh, that I haven't poured into the setup. Um, it strips every single business day from seven o'clock to four o'clock, there's something in the stripper. So I don't have a way of explaining how many sets of wheels I've done because we're stripping all different things, but we're stripping powder and paint and even anodizing uh, PVD coatings, for example. Um, lots of different things. So as much as I would like to give you an answer on how many sets of wheels it can do, the best answer I can give you is that at last month stripping, you know, literally all day, every day. Now, the biggest thing that I can recommend is checking your pH levels. Uh, you can get a pH testing kit on Amazon, eBay, whatever. I'm sure local places you can get them as well um, because you're gonna wanna make sure to keep the pH up. Now, we did some testing. You can kind of see that throughout this video. Uh, it got down to around 12, a pH of 12, and you want it to be up above 12. Uh, this product, I think, kind of sits in the, I wanna say it was around 13, just fresh out of the barrel. Um, so what we did is we drained all of the existing chemical back into an empty drum that we had. Actually, I think this drum had a little bit of brand new chemical in it, if I can remember, if I remember correctly, but mostly just put it into a barrel that we had existing. Uh, and then you can see here, I'm just scooping out the sludge because the sludge at the very bottom, if you have parts that are sitting down at the bottom, the sludge actually does have a negative impact on how well it will strip for you. It's not to say that it won't strip. It still takes stuff off. It just takes, when it's in the sludge, it just takes a bit longer. Plus, you got to remember that this chemical is active. So anytime that there's sludge in there, that chemical is still working to break that sludge down more and more and more. So, you know, the theoretically cleaner you can keep this stuff, the better. So we scoop all the sludge out, put it in a bucket, and then we end up, you know, kind of cheating here. We load the barrel back onto the forklift and tip it over so that we can then pour it into this uh, drum to fill it back up. Now, because there was a little bit of chemical, brand new chemical in this drum, this naturally is going to increase the pH level some. I mean, we got rid of the sludge. You know, we're in theory taking old chemical and a little bit of new chemical. Uh, and we end up doing pH testing once it's in there. Hey everyone, I hope you're liking the video. I know Sean has a big announcement coming on New Year's. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. Oh yeah, that's right. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. I actually do have a big announcement about the channel starting on New Year's. It's gonna be a lot of changes on the channel. Uh, the video that comes out New Year's Day is going to kind of explain all of that stuff. But we're going to be doing a ton of videos through the rest of December here. So, uh, you know, hit that subscribe button. Turn on all notifications so you get a heads up when we post. Uh, hit that like button as well. Definitely helps us get our videos out in front of more people. So as you can see here, we're cheating once again with the forklift. We're just pouring this chemical back in. Um, this nozzle that's on top of this barrel that makes this so much easier uh, as opposed to just pumping it in once again you're gonna need a forklift to do this effectively so if you don't have one of those ignore this part but this nozzle is a game changer um, this nozzle has a full 360 head so you can open it in any direction to get it to you know let the chemicals out so to speak uh, which means you can definitely like regulate how fast it comes out because uh, when it's at full tilt, uh, it's putting a lot of chemical in very fast. Like you're not going to want to walk away from this thing for any period of time. We're actually just standing right off camera here watching this as it comes out. But if you have a forklift and you're not using a setup like this, you're just uncapping the end of this, you're making a mistake. I mean, you can see how fast this is already filled up. So we're going to shut it down. We're going to end up taking this back out away. And uh, the next step for us is going to be doing a pH test. So once again, there's pH testers everywhere. I 
I was going to give you guys kind of a breakdown on how the pH testing works, but I realized that all these pH testers are, the, are different and they all have different calibration setups. Um, I actually recorded this. I'm voicing over the whole thing because I did the calibration for this particular setup in the video and then I realized that oh, I have another pH testing setup that's completely different for calibration. So just make sure you follow the directions and do the calibration. I mean, this doesn't have to be perfect. We're just looking for a ballpark range. But as you can see, just mixing in the new chemical in this or just that little bit of new chemical and getting rid of all the sludge, we increased the pH, you know, almost a full point. So we also have potassium hydroxide, which is like the really aggressive additive. If you want to do that. And then we have this. This is the RML 2000 cleaner. All of this stuff is available through Express Chem. Um, I think it's all on their website. Uh, but if not, you can contact Matt. His information is down below. We want to bump up the pH a bit more. So we're actually, this is a five gallon drum. We're going to pour one gallon into this drum to try to increase that pH. Um, I actually did end up, I think, doing a pH test on this, but I don't think I recorded it. And this bumped it up to like 13, 3 or 4, if I remember correctly. So, and this is just an additive. Like I said, this is, uh, this is kind of replacing one of the main ingredients in this that will make the chemical more effective. Uh, as far as what it's been stripping, I've been stripping everything with this. I know there's a lot of people worried about certain metals not being able to go in there. This is steel, but it was all brazed with brass. Uh, brass is one of those ones that like B17 will kind of go after sometimes if you leave it in there or any of the methylene chloride based strippers, I should say not B17, definitely get rim strip. If you're going to use one of those, uh, another thing that we tried doing was anodizing. So I talked to Matt and he wasn't actually sure if this would strip anodizing and a kind of weird thing happened. I put these in here and I let them sit. They weren't in there for very long. Um, they were in there for probably 45 minutes. And when I pulled them out, you could see all the ends were, um, that were sticking out were still black, but you can also see one of them didn't strip at all. And Matt didn't know why. I don't know why. I ended up putting it back in there and it did eventually strip. So I don't know. I, I wish I could explain that to you. I'm just saying if you run into that problem, just make sure you put it back in there for a little bit longer and it will in fact strip. Another thing that we threw in here is stuff like this. This is a uh, ashtray that sits at a bus stop. It's one of those, you know, like fireproof ashtray setups uh, where you can put a cigarette down and it drops way down into a thing. So even if there's a problem, it stays in this container. These have a super thick coating on them. And as you can see, this stuff stripped it off real fast. Uh, this is sitting over in the rinse thing. This is before I rinsed it. It just is all like that. Uh, PVD coating. This is the kind of chrome coating that you see on wheels sometimes. A lot of black chrome. It's kind of the new age way of doing things. Uh, this stuff strips it as well. You can see these two bare wheels. So um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, let's get into some of the questions that you guys had. All right, so first things first, if you guys uh, see these questions and they're kind of too long just to read in my, you know, while I'm reading this response, uh, just hit pause, uh, give it a read, and then keep listening. I'm actually going to answer this, even though it's already kind of covered in here. The sludge at the bottom will absolutely affect how long the stripper lasts. So make sure that you're cleaning it out. We were doing it every couple weeks. Uh, we're stripping every day and doing it every couple weeks. It's not that bad of a task. Uh, we're actually in the new setup kind of fabricated a tool to do that scooping for us. So we didn't have to tip up, tip the barrel over and do it with a shovel just because that was kind of a nightmare to do, honestly. This was actually another question that came up a number of times is how to get rid of the rinse water or, you know, the remnants or leftover eco strip, whatever the case might be. I thought about trying to come up with a good way of telling you or even telling you the way that we do it. But then I realized that everywhere is going to be a little bit different, whether it's city, county, state, or, you know, country, if you're in a different country, uh, they're all going to have their own standards. So I would recommend contacting your local board, whoever that might be in, you know, your city, state, county, whatever the case might be, uh, and getting the right answers from them. Because honestly, I don't want to be responsible for giving you an answer that works where I'm located, but it's definitely the wrong answer where you are because they're all going to be a little bit different. Um, this isn't a hazardous product, so it should be pretty easy to get rid of, uh, at a bare minimum. You could always just call one of the hazardous material disposal places and they can definitely get rid of it for you, but you probably don't even need to go that far. I actually don't know if they have something for the 85 gallon drums. Um, there are obviously tons of different things that you could put this chemical in and figure out a way to heat. It's just a matter of, you know, how industrious you want to be in accomplishing that goal. Um, I would definitely look and see if you could find 
heat wraps for some of the bigger drums, especially if you want to be able to do bigger parts. I think there's a question later in this that kind of covers what size parts you can do. Um, but look into, you know, tanks. If you want to use a tank and then a submersible heater or what's called a line heater that kind of heats up the bottom, uh, all of those are options. It's kind of going to depend on your setup and your needs a lot of the time. We fired this up on a Monday, kind of, you know, part way into winter, or at least deep into fall. And so the temperature in the shop was fairly low. I mean, it's not like freezing in the shop or anything like that, but it took, I want to say it was like five hours to get up to 140. At 140, it's already stripping pretty much anything you'll put in it. Uh, it just works better up in like the 160 range for sure, or even a little bit higher. Um, we end up turning the stripper or the heater down when we leave for the day to keep it kind of warm overnight. Nothing crazy. We just don't want it to get cold because we know it gets cold in the shop uh, and then fire it up again the next day. So the new setup that we have is not like that. Uh, we're running a completely different setup and it heats up much faster. Once again, I'm going to do a video here in the next couple weeks that shows that setup. But for most people, this is actually going to work, especially if you can leave it on and just keep it, you know, moderately warm. Uh, you can also insulate the drum. I know a lot of people have insulated these to definitely help keep the heat in. And we also put the lid on overnight uh, and also clamp it down just to make sure that all the heat is staying in. But just make sure if you are clamping it that you end up having one of the vents open on it because you don't want to be pressurizing a drum, obviously. I had a number of people contact me about the whole whether or not you could use it with magnesium. Now, I only had two different types of magnesium. They are the two most common that you're going to find, at least in this industry, at least. Um, I tested both of them and both of them were fine. I actually left both of them in there over the weekend. Now, to be fair, it was a heated tank that we had then turned the heater way down on. So the next, you know, through the weekend, obviously the temp lowers and maybe that does have some effect. But my point is it was in there for days and didn't seem to affect the magnesium in any capacity. So I assume that the website was saying that as like an abundance of caution. I can only tell you from my own experience that it did not affect magnesium in any way. Uh, we put, I put an Evo valve cover in there and then a motorcycle part. Actually, that reminds me, I also put a power tools part in there. I think it was like a piece off of a chainsaw, if I remember correctly, and it was not affected either. So the best advice I can give you is to always test your parts and see, but from my experience so far, it has not had a negative effect on magnesium. Yes, they actually will deliver this product to home. Um, and as far as how long it took to get, uh, it was within a week of ordering. I don't remember exactly, but I mean, it was fast enough that I wasn't going to question it. And I live on there, you know, I was having it delivered to the other side of the country from where it started. So um, obviously there's going to be some factors, you know, if stock is low or harder to get at the time, it might take a little bit longer, but it should be fairly quick. You can always contact Matt. His information is down in the description. The safe answer for this is honestly just no. Uh, methylene chloride actually has an incredibly low boiling point. I want to say it's around 100 degrees. Uh, so heating up is actually just going to cause evaporation to happen at a really high rate. And you definitely don't want to be doing that. It's also way unsafe. These are available literally everywhere. Uh, I think I got this one off of Amazon. It's just called a drum wrench or a barrel wrench. Um, Definitely beats having to try to spin those things off with like a flathead screwdriver and a hammer, honestly. These things make it much, much better. And they're cheap. They're like eight or nine bucks. You absolutely do not have to have stripper. I actually did a full video um, showing why stripper would be beneficial or why blasting might be beneficial depending on what you're doing. Uh, go through back, back through my videos. If I remember, I'll put it in the description. But I think the title of the video is Do You Need Chemical Stripper? Um... So the answer is, I don't know. It depends on what you're doing, but I enjoy Chemical Stripper and it does make taking powder coat off much easier. I actually don't know if it's available in the UK, but the contact information from Matt is down below in the description of this video. So go ahead and shoot him an email and I'm sure he'll be happy to help you. I know with this drum, it will fit a 20. You can actually put two of them in there fairly well or three if they were real narrow, I guess. Um, we have since gone to a bigger setup, so wheel size isn't really a concern anymore, but it will fit a 20, fit a 20 multiple times. So you don't need to sandblast because you use the chemicals. You use the sandblasting to etch the surface to give a good profile for powder to stick to because powder requires, requires a mechanical bond. I guess I probably should have grouped this one with the other question that was similar to this. I actually don't know. I uh, don't even know if they exist. So it's something that you would probably have to try to look up. Uh, you could maybe use two 55-gallon ones and keep it wrapped around twice. I, I really don't know. 
All right, guys, that wraps up this video. Uh, make sure you jump on Facebook and check out the UKC Army Facebook group. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, uh, hit that like, share this video with a friend, a powder coating friend or a friend you want to start powder coating with, whatever the case might be. Um, next video that's going to be coming up about Chemical Stripper is actually going to be showing the new setup, which uh, you see right here in this video, including a lot of new chemical to go with it. So make sure you check that out and uh, look forward to seeing you next time.